Chapter 21 Appreciations Economic Freedom and Interventionism Man, Economy, and State Most of what goes today under the label of the social sciences is poorly disguised apologetics for the policies of governments. What the philosopher George Santayana, 1863-1952, once said about a teacher of philosophy of the then Royal Prussian University of Berlin, that it seemed to this man that a professor's business was to trudge along a government towpath with a legal cargo. Is today everywhere true for the majority of those appointed to teach economics? As these doctors see it, all the evils that plague mankind are caused by the acquisitiveness of greedy exploiters, speculators, and monopolists, who are supreme in the conduct of affairs in the market economy. The foremost task of good government is to curb these scoundrels by suppressing their economic freedom and subjecting all affairs to the decisions of the central authority. Full government control of everybody's activities, whether called planning, socialism, communism, or any other name, is praised as the panacea. To make these ideas plausible, one had to proscribe as orthodox, classical, neoclassical, and reactionary all that economics had brought forward before the emergence of the New Deal, the Fair Deal, and the New Frontier. Any acquaintance with pre-Keynesian economics is considered as rather unsuitable and unseemly for an up-to-date economist. It could easily raise in his mind some critical thoughts. It could encourage him to reflect instead of meekly endorsing the empty slogans of governments and powerful pressure groups. There is, in fact, in the writings and teachings of those who nowadays call themselves economists, no longer any comprehension of the operation of the economic system as such. Their books and articles do not describe, analyze, or explain the economic phenomena. They do not pay attention to the interdependence and mutuality of the various individuals and groups' activities. In their view, there exists different economic spheres that have to be treated by and large as isolated domains. They dissolve economics into a number of special fields, such as economics of labor, agriculture, insurance, foreign trade, domestic trade, and so on. These books and articles deal with the height of wage rates, for example, as if it were possible to treat this subject independently of the problems of commodity prices, interest, profit, and loss, and all the other issues of economics. They assemble without any idea for what purpose they are doing it, a vast array of statistical and other historical data about the recent past, which they choose to style the present. They entirely fail to comprehend the interconnectedness and mutual determination of the actions of the various individuals whose behavior results in the emergence of the market economy. The economic writings of the last decades provide a pitiful story of progressing deterioration and degradation. Even a comparison of the recent publications of many older authors with their previous writings shows an advancing decline. The few, very few good contributions that came out in our age were smeared as old-fashioned and reactionary by the government economists, boycotted by the universities, the academic magazines and the newspapers, and ignored by the public. Let us hope that the fate of Murray N. Rothbard's book, Man, Economy, and State, Princeton, D. Van Nostra, 1962, will be different. Dr. Rothbard is already well known as the author of several excellent monographs. Now, as the result of many years of sagacious and discerning meditation, he joins the ranks of eminent economists by publishing a voluminous work, a systematic treatise on economics. The main virtue of this book is that it is a comprehensive and methodical analysis of all activities commonly called economic. It looks upon these activities as human action, i.e. as conscious striving after chosen ends by resorting to appropriate means. This cognition exposes the fateful effort of the mathematical treatment of economic problems. The mathematical economist attempts to ignore the difference between physical phenomena on the one hand, the emergence and consummation of which man is unable to see the operation of any final causes, and which can be studied scientifically only because there prevails a perceptible regularity in their concatenation and succession, and praxeological phenomena on the other hand that lack such a regularity but are conceivable to the human mind as the outcomes of purposeful aiming at definite ends chosen. Mathematical equations, says Rothbard, are appropriate and useful where there are constant quantitative relations among unmotivated variables. They are inappropriate in the field of conscious behavior. In a few brilliant lines, he demolishes the main device of mathematical economists, vis-a-vis -vis the fallacious idea of substituting the concepts of mutual determination and equilibrium 
for the allegedly outdated concept of cause and effect. And he shows that the concepts of equilibrium and the evenly rotating economy do not refer to reality. Although indispensable for any economic inquiry, they are merely auxiliary mental tools to aid us in the analysis of real action. The equations of physics describes a process through time, while those of economics do not describe a process at all, but merely the final equilibrium point, a hypothetical situation that is outside of time and will never be reached in reality. Furthermore, they cannot say anything about the path by which the economy moves in the direction of the final equilibrium position. As there are no constant relations between any of the elements which the science of action studies, there is no measurement possible, and all numerical data available have merely an historical character. They belong to economic history and not to economics as such. The positivist slogan, science is measurement, in no way refers to the sciences of human action. The claims of econometrics are vain. In every chapter of his treatise, Dr. Rothbard, adopting the best of the teachings of his predecessors and adding to them highly important observations, not only develops the correct theory, but is no less anxious to refute all objections ever raised against these doctrines. He exposes the fallacies and contradictions of the popular interpretation of economic affairs. Thus, for instance, in dealing with the problem of unemployment, he points out, in the whole modern and Keynesian discussion of the subject, the missing link is precisely the wage rate. It is meaningless to talk of unemployment or employment without reference to a wage rate. Whatever supply of labor services brought to market can be sold, but only if wages are set at whatever rate will clear the market. If a man wishes to be employed, he will be, provided the wage rate is adjusted according to what Rothbard calls his discounted marginal value product i.e. the present height of the value which the consumers, at the time of the final sale of the product, will ascribe to his contribution to its production. Whenever the job seeker insists on a higher wage, he will remain unemployed. If people refuse to be employed except at places, in occupations, or at wage rates they would like, then they are likely to be choosing unemployment for substantial periods. The full import of this state of affairs becomes manifest if one gives attention to the fact that, under present conditions, those offering their services on the labor market themselves represent the immense majority of the consumers whose buying or abstention from buying ultimately determines the height of wage rates. Less successful than his investigations in the fields of general praxeology and economics are the author's occasional observations concerning the philosophy of law and some problems of the penal code. But disagreement with his opinions concerning these matters cannot prevent me from qualifying Rothbard's work as an ethical contribution to the general science of human action, praxeology, and its practically most important and up to now best elaborated part, economics. Henceforth, all essential studies in these branches of knowledge will have to take full account of the theories and criticisms expounded by Dr. Rothbard. The publication of a standard book on economics raises again an important question vis-a-vis -vis for whom are essays of this consequence written? Only for specialists, the students of economics, or for all of the people? To answer this question, we have to keep in mind that the citizens in their capacity as voters are called upon to determine ultimately all issues of economic policies. The fact that the masses are ignorant of physics and do not know anything substantial about electricity does not obstruct the endeavors of experts who utilize the teachings of science for the satisfaction of the wants of the consumers. From various points of view, one may deplore the intellectual insufficiency and indolence of the multitude. But their ignorance regarding the achievements of the natural sciences does not endanger our spiritual and material welfare. It is quite different in the field of economics. The fact that the majority of our contemporaries, the masses of semi-barbarians led by self-styled intellectuals, entirely ignore everything that economics has brought forward, is the main political problem of our age. There is no use in deceiving ourselves. American public opinion rejects the market economy, the capitalistic free enterprise system that provided the nation with the highest standard of living ever attained. Full government control of all activities of the individual is virtually the goal of both national parties. The individual is to be deprived of his moral, political, and economic responsibility and autonomy and to be converted into a pawn in the schemes of a supreme authority aiming at a national purpose. 
His affluence is to be cut down for the benefit of what is called the public sector, i.e. the machine operated by the party in power. Hosts of authors, writers, and professors are busy denouncing alleged shortcomings of capitalism and exalting the virtues of planning. Full of quasi-religious ardor, the immense majority is advocating measures that step-by-step step lead to the methods of administration practiced in Moscow and in Peking. If we want to avoid the destruction of Western civilization and the relapse into primitive wretchedness, we must change the mentality of our fellow citizens. We must make them realize what they owe to the much vilified economic freedom, the system of free enterprise and capitalism. The intellectuals and those who call themselves educated must use their superior cognitive faculties and power of reasoning for the refutation of erroneous ideas about social, political, and economic problems and for the dissemination of a correct grasp of the operation of the market economy. They must start by familiarizing themselves with all the issues involved in order to teach those who are blinded by ignorance and emotions. They must learn in order to acquire the ability to enlighten the misguided many. It is a fateful error on the part of our most valuable contemporaries to believe that economics can be left to specialists in the same way in which various fields of technology can be safely left to those who have chosen to make any one of them their vocation. The issues of society's economic organization are every citizen's business. To master them to the best of one's ability is the duty of everyone. Now such a book as Man, Economy, and State offers to every intelligent man an opportunity to obtain reliable information concerning the great controversies and conflicts of our age. It is certainly not easy reading and asks for the utmost exertion of one's attention. But there are no shortcuts to wisdom. The Economist Eugene von Bombawerk on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of his death. Eugene von Bombawerk will remain unforgotten for all those who have known him. The students who enjoyed the fortune of attending his seminars will never lose what the acquaintance with such a strong mind has given them. For the politicians who have met him as a statesman, the integrity of his ethos and his altruistic commitment to duty will continue to be exemplary. And no citizen of this country shall forget the Minister of Finance, the last Austrian Minister of Finance, who in spite of all obstacles, earnestly aimed at balancing the budget and preventing the upcoming financial catastrophe. But even when the lives of all those who had known him personally have come to an end, his scientific oeuvre shall live on and bear fruit. In his scientific work, Baumbauer focused from the outset on the central problem of theoretical economics, the interest problem. At the age of 25, in the spring of 1876, he gave a lecture on the interest on capital in the Nice Seminar in Heidelberg, which already contained the main feature of what would later become his famous agio theory of interest. Before he could, however, publish his work, there were difficult preliminary questions to answer. It was to these questions that he dedicated his work. Always keeping the ultimate object in mind, he published Rechte und Verhaltenes vom Standpunkt der Volkswirtschaftlichen Gutleher in 1881, Die Geschichte und Kritik der Kapitalismus Theorie in 1884, Grundzug der Theorie der Wirtschaftlichen Guterbertes in 1886, and finally his Positive Theory des Kapitals in 1889. His work was thereby brought to completion. As senior legal secretary and head of division in the Ministry of Finance, as KUK Minister of Finance and President of the Senate of the Higher Administrative Court, he had very little leisure in the following years to perform any scientific work. Only since 1904, when he retired from office for the third and last time, could he devote himself again undisturbed to his research. A series of excellent works is the fruit of the tireless effort during the last decade that he was allowed to live. He died on August 27, in 1914, when the Austrian armies were about to fight the first battles of the Great War in Poland and Eastern Galicia. Bombauer's scientific work has quickly found the recognition it richly deserves. His magnum opus, The Positive Theory of Capital, was translated into English by William Smart as early as 1890. Shortly afterward, a French edition followed. In England, the United States, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark, his doctrine became the starting point for further in-depth analyses and studies. Sure enough, in Germany, an understanding of Baum's achievements was long missing. The prevailing doctrine at the universities ignored him. 
It took decades until the accomplishments of the Austrian school were recognized in the Reich. Today, however, it is considered a grave mischief that only Baum Bauwerk's magnum opus, which is already in its fourth German language edition, is easily accessible. His shorter writings, which are indispensable for any friend of economic inquiry, are rather difficult to access. It is therefore a thankworthy enterprise to republish them in a collected edition. A student of Baum Bauwerk, well known for several scientific works, has addressed himself to this task. The well-endowed volume, which is graced with a felicitous portrait of Baum, contains the above-mentioned work, Recte und Verhaltenisse, along with a tract on general theory and methodology, essays on the theory of value, and finally an essay that has been published on January 6, 8, and 9, 1924, in the Neue Freie Press, entitled Un Ser Passive Handelsbilanz. It starts with a short biographical introduction by the editor, Dr. Franz X. Weiss. The essays on capital and interest, which are not contained in this collection, shall be republished in a separate volume. To praise the tremendous value of the theoretical works collected in this volume would be like bringing owls to Athens. For the experts and numerous intellectuals who are concerned with economic questions, this would hardly constitute anything new. Let us, however, quote some sentences from the above-mentioned essay on the passive balance of trade, merely to emphasize the sharpness with which Baum has early on pointed to the fundamental problem underlying our state finances. It reads, thrift is never popular. If parliaments have historically been the guardians of thrift, they now have turned much rather into its sworn enemies. Nowadays, the political and national parties, maybe not exclusively in our own country, but certainly also here, tend to develop a certain covetousness, almost considered to be dutiful, for all kinds of benefits for their own electorate at the expense of the general public. And when the political situation is relatively convenient, that is to say, if it is relatively inconvenient for the government, one's ends can be achieved through political pressure. Our population suffers from economical megalomania. This is, among other things, shown by the investments from the public purse. One is often mistaken when using the famous slogan of indirect productivity of public spending, even if at times the indirect advantages of public enterprises, which are unprofitable by themselves, may exceed the amount that has to be paid from public funds for their passive operations. The blind eulogists of frivolous investment policies will feel the mistakes of their approach only when, like these days, the capital stock has been exhausted by the public sector over many years to a degree that capital is lacking for the most important and vital private businesses in all spheres. Only when many enterprises begin to stumble, many projects have to remain undone, and all suffer severely from the increased rate of interest. These were the last words that Baum Bauwerk has addressed to Austria's financial authorities. Today, they will be valued more highly than at the time when they were first published in this newspaper. The Mises Institute hopes you have enjoyed this audiobook. For a world of free market literature, media, and discussion, visit Mises.org.